Cool. Ladies no and gentlemen, you are listening to the Iron Bark Podcast. Today, we have two guests, longtime friends of the podcast. We have Scott and Tom returning. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Thanks hey, for what's going on? Here. Thanks for having Good us, buddy. Me. It's been a long time since we've all been together on a podcast because we always have other priorities, mostly gaming, but uh, here we are. So yeah. I just want to talk about uh, the news first, some news that's come along. Jasper National Park caught on fire, primarily the town. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a sad set of circumstances. I don't really, I'm don't really. i not going to get into the political stuff and play the blame game. I don't really think that's appropriate. I think people are trying to capitalize on that. But um, I want to go through like a list of like ideas and recommendations to how to like prevent this stuff from happening in the future. And you guys just kind of give me your thoughts on those ideas recap what's happening right now because it's like the biggest fire or the worst one in 100 years but what's the actual like size or metrics that's happening here do you have any basically data? there's hundreds of forest fires that happen all the time every year a lot of the time they're confined to like rural small areas they're controlled rel- relatively well this one came across like a mountainscape forest came close to the town jumped the roadway or the railway came in contact with the town the lodge caught on fire uh the gas i think the gas station did as well uh, a couple of houses a few houses burnt down uh normally these things are usually controlled before they get to the the towns because there's you know roadways large clear cuts of like forest like lines um in sections cut out so it's difficult for the fires to jump but uh, yeah, like fire breaks. Yeah, fire break. That's what it's called. Yeah, there's not really that many fire breaks though, because it's so hard to maintain. It's so expensive. You know, it seems like pretty easy. Why don't they just like cut a cut some fire breaks in everywhere? But it's really devastating to the nature. It's devastating to the forest, and it's really, really hard and expensive to maintain. So I know for a fact there's not that many fire breaks. I think there was like enough that were like appropriately located that they thought it wouldn't become an issue for the town. Like it, like obviously the forest would still like suffer, but I don't know. They didn't really think it could make it to the the town proper, and like people's houses and stuff will catch on fire. Yeah, um, but like, huge yeah, who knows? Maybe they could have been bigger or there been more. But I was gonna say, huge parts of forest burn all the time. Like you say, there's multiple forest fires every year. Is this one only significant because it it touched like population, like populated area, a popular area on top of that? Yeah, it's a it's a massive tourist True. destination. It's True. a place Tourists, where like yeah. a lot of people have memories of and stuff like that. Uh, other towns get hit. Uh, other small towns have gotten hit, but uh, uh, Jasper, like you burn down Jasper, you lose all the tourism from there, right? Like if there's a lot of there, businesses are probably going to suffer now. Yeah, even yeah. if they're still standing. So I don't know. Different things people said it was like the wind directions. They st- apparently it was like a fire that started in British Columbia. It's pretty close, right? So it just kind of came across there. So there's people kind of pointing fingers at like who was responsible, this and that. Why did you say something sooner? But there's tons mm-hmm. of uh, fires every year, like hundreds of them. Uh, you know, there's whether they make it to a town or not. It's a whole different scenario. Depends on like wind, like how strong the wind is, where it blows it, that type of yeah, thing. yeah, for sure, for sure. But, All right, um, so what are what are your ideas there? Okay, so my first idea, this is a bit this is a bit ridiculous. I don't know if it's a good one, but I think it is. So, an emergency hydro cannon water system around the town. Uh, there's a town in Japan called I think it's called Keabuki no Sato. It's an ancient yeah, village the in the Kyoto yeah. prefecture of Japan. And basically, yeah. there's like videos of it online if anyone listening wants to search it where the fire like cannons or the water cannons come out of like little shrines or little buildings and they just kind of unleash like an entire rainbow of water yeah it's a small village and they have thatched roofs i've seen that before this is like jasper's a huge town and they're just trees you know they don't have like little thatched huts and stuff that are that are you know they need to wet in order for them to not lay on fire yeah but you figure they already have the sprinkler system in place that how expensive is it to add that on or to maintain is probably the problem. What do you mean they already have one in place like around the town of Jasper? No, I'm just saying like okay, when the fire department shows up, they hook up to a uh, fire hydrant. So imagine just mm. having something hooked up to the fire hydrants or system already in place that would automatically uh, turn on with maybe more pressure from a central area that turns it on. 
Yeah, but now we're just referring to more, I think, like the perimeter of the town. So the town doesn't catch a fire. Yeah. No, no. It could right? be like the whole town. Like you could just have them everywhere where it's like they just turn on. It's like basically leaving the hose on. You just, you don't, you flip the switch and then all of a sudden it's just constant flow of water all over the town, just keeping everything wet. Now, There's Forest a fires company, are pretty... I, I saw that they, they're pushing to install basically a sprinkler system on your roof. If you're already, like you're a homeowner, you can buy this. And it's basically just sprinklers that will just start spitting water when you know it's high risk for fire. So at least the fire may come through, but it'll go around your property if it's saturated enough, I guess. Yeah, but the thing is, I think forest, there's a there's an idea going out there that the forest fires are just so hot and they're just so prominent. They're just so strong that the water would basically inst- instantly vaporize to the point right. where it's not going to protect anything. And I don't know if that's accurate or not, but... I don't know. It seems like an idea worth like looking into. It's yeah. It's just like very intricate and expensive to do something like that. It and you're right. They burn so hot but, because even those yeah. fire breaks, those fire breaks, there's like stories of um these fire breaks that are like 150 feet, 200 feet right through a forest. But like you said about the wind, the embers pick up on on the wind from the forest and blow across. It's just blowing like millions of embers, and so many of them make it through. Then the fire just reignites. So fire breaks aren't even too effective, you know. And the sprinkler heard? system just seems like a lot. <laughs> you know, you maybe of, for like a small town, but not have you heard of it. zombie fires? Apparently, this is a thing. No, what's that? Apparently, the, a lot of these forest fires persist throughout the winter time, and they're like underneath, like the snow and shit underground. They're just burning underground constantly. Like they travel the root system. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. They're called like zombie, and that's how, and they just start right back up, like when spring starts again. I mean, oh, wasn't that a job from, for a guy <laughs> that just it might travel? Be from, um, what do you mean by that? God, the, the, don't you remember back, like, I mean, I've I've seen, like, movies or books about, like, uh, there was one person who was assigned to keeping the fire alive as they would travel from their new settlement to their next settlement uh, because it was that hard to make a fire back then or they needed to set up for the night quickly. So there would be maybe a group of four oh, people okay. out of the... Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Out of whatever yeah. you call it, the herd of of people walking, and they would tend that fire, still throw just to keep the embers alive. Mm. Yeah, no, I haven't heard that, but it makes sense. But Tom, just turn your mic down just a smidge because you keep hitting the red, and it's going to sound terrible. Yeah, um, no problem. Uh, this uh, zo- the zombie so, fire stuff. Um, yeah. I think that it might be from emulsification, no? From leaves and stuff getting compact under underground, and then the emulsifying. Probably, like I don't even know. I, yeah. Like when I think I about it, I'm like, it. it needs oxygen. I'm like, how is it even getting oxygen under there? Is Dude, it just look constantly it up, man. smoldering? Look, like... look it up about. You know when you make a big pile of leaves, like in the fall time, yeah, and you just make a big pile of leaves, and in the middle you think, oh, it's dark, it's damp, the wheat leaves are wet, it's like the the um, coolest spot, but that is the highest risk of fire because of the right, emulsification right. process. Right, yeah. that's like so. It's the same concept, has, like. Yeah. Under uh, maybe under the snow, the same. It's more like chemical rather than uh, than you know strict like like you'd think uh, fuel and oxygen and 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 uh, source kind of thing. Yeah, it's just crazy to think of like even in like a week of like negative forty snowfall, it's just still under there, just like yeah, cooking. Anyway, the next dude. Let me tell you a quick story. When I was younger, I was thinking about this at my cottage. We had the cottage in Grafton by Coburg. We had a fire on the beach. We had like this bonfire. It was really cool. It's like a big rocky beach, right? And we had this big fire pit. And then we all go to sleep, whatever. We're like kids. And then the next morning, um, after we eat breakfast, my brother goes out and he's like, oh, I'm going to go uh, try and restart the fire from uh, from the embers. And I look at the fire and it's just like a pile of ash. And I was like, what? And I was like, what is he doing? And I was like, 10 hours ago or something, the fire is lit. And then he goes out and he's working on it. He's like using um, little tiny twigs or whatever, some kindling. And, and he finds this one ember under there and he like blows on it and he gets it going again from that. And I was like, holy shit, like I can't believe that uh, this fire was, uh, you know, reignited from that after after being sitting there for so long. Like it, I couldn't believe it. I don't know why I always remember that. I guess that's why they always get on campers to be like, hey, <clears throat> you guys need to put out your fire all the way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because it can oh. just reignite from that little log just sitting there. Yeah. Exactly. All right. My next recommendation: there's this, there's these things, there's these trains they have, 
And it's basically just a railroad company, I think, protecting their assets. But it's basically giant water tanks with water cannons on it as well. And they call it like the Poseidon train. But I think if we had like more of them or they were bigger, that'd be like another thing they do. And that kind of works as like a like a fire break as well. Yeah. But, but you would, just said they run out of the... water on the train? Yes. Like how, how how much <laughs> water can they actually hold? I don't know, man. They're like big. It's like a you ever see like a big train like moving like gas and stuff. It's like these big like containers. It's basically the size of like, no, for sure. Yeah, like the milk trucks or whatever, right? Or gas, whatever. You a want milk to say. truck. Like the milk trucks, the silver it means like a tanker on the highway, like a tanker. Oh, yeah, a tanker, yeah. bro. Yeah. Yeah, Same a tanker. Concept. Yeah, milk it's tanker. like a tanker with the word milk on. I don't it. want to call it a milk tanker. <laughs> <laughs> So it's going to run out of water and who's going to bring the tracks at that point you might as well just have a truck that runs the fire break or whatever I mean and those things aren't mm. that wide based on what I just looked up they're only up to like 12 feet wide but I feel like based on images they look a lot wider or 15 feet wide. Feet, well. okay what about okay okay my idea sucks so far apparently okay third idea <laughs> more protection conservation and introductions of native wildlife that eats dry vegetation. Uh, is cows? What? what basically, uh, goats. <laughs> Built goats, basically. Goats? <laughs> yeah, feed the grizzly bears. It's gonna go great. I don't know, man. Is that what happens? Is that what's lit? First, I start from dry. Okay, vegetation. I'll give you a bit of history. There used to be mm -hmm. an insect called the Rocky Mountain locust. The Rocky Mountain locust was basically like a weather phenomenon because there were just so many of them. It would just be like a giant dust cloud, like a giant sand cloud, but it was all locusts, just like a like a massive like insect swarm of bugs. They were problematic for agriculture because they would just devour entire swaths of crops. So what people started doing is they put out bounties to kill all these things, and they knew where their eggs were. The eggs were like on riverbanks and stuff like that, and they were giving bounties for anyone who had like a bushel full of eggs. I think a lot of the forest fires might be in some way a little bit related to the extinction of the Rocky Mountain locust because those things would probably also go around eating a ton of dry vegetation, removing that, stopping its ability to ignite easily, and that sort of thing. But uh, obviously, the agricultural impact was too great. But So I think you need to compensate for that loss of that, the extinction of that species by bringing in Something that can help compensate for it, maybe just a tiny bit. And I don't know if that means more goats or what, or bighorn sheep. I'm not exactly sure what species is going to eat a lot of dry. Can you imagine, plantation. like, how much, how many square kilometers there is that you'd have to prevent dry vegetation from growing with goats? <laughs> all goats do is eat all day. They just walk around eating. That's all they do. Do they eat only that... dry vegetation or do they eat fresh no, grass? they mostly look for like salt and minerals and stuff. No, but don't they use goats? Mm. Is, isn't there a company that uh, will, you can rent a goat and stake it on your property and it'll eat that circle within like two hours and then you move the stake and it yeah, eats the next yeah. circle? Like you've seen that before, right? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's a thing. That's a service. It, but so mm -hmm. it will eat live vegetation, which is problematic, I'm sure. Yeah, that's the thing. It doesn't eat just eat dry vegetation. And I, I mean, you're that, saying locusts. I, I think that sounds, Alberta. It sounds kind of scary idea. when you're saying that, but or you got a good grasshoppers. Idea. They're just grasshoppers. Yeah. I think That's that Alberta, weird. in the hot spot areas, that always have the firefighters should break up the regions into like 50 different small regions, and use all their instruments, like all their their um their um moisture detection detection rainfall trackers, all these metrics with AI to establish a danger threshold for if fires are going to likely happen there or not, and then just pool resources and into preventing them for that area or fighting them for that area because they know it's going to come and, and, and have different indicators for all these smaller regions. What do you think about that? Rather than fighting the fire once it happens, just focus on preventing. I think you should just do the water sprinkler system. You just invest the millions of dollars into like the, like, piping system yeah but it's such a just... huge area and what are you gonna you can think you're gonna fight jasper's not a big fire? town jasper's not Dude, a big that town. little that, li that little town that you're talking about was preventing fires from occurring naturally on the thatch roofs because how dry it is and they're soaking them having a sprinkler system for for all of jasper against a forest fire that's incoming is not going to do anything I think forest I fires think are like, oh my god, dude. if you break up acreage so the fires will still happen but this would be like a break wall with like so just imagine the break wall with water sprinklers 
to dump. Might as well up. just have a straight line sprinkler underground that just shoots it right up in the air, like like a water wall. Call it water wall. Network wants <laughs> that's to build ingenious. a water wall. I think that's ingenious. That's the way to do <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, seriously, just make a fire break that with a freaking water wall right and right. and have the water <laughs> wall. Right wall. Listen, have the water wall drain back into itself and right back to its own pump so it's retaining its own water it doesn't even need an infinite source it's self-sustaining the river man. there's rivers there that are like super powerful yeah, why not just make it. rivers how about these fires actually need to happen they have to happen they That's are a natural part of it but you don't want the town to burn down well no i mean you don't want a lot of things to happen but that happens so protect the property at best but the trees gotta go gotta make room for new life well, they're gone now. Like that's oh, like that. Like, but this is like you we want to apply what happened here to like maybe possibly protecting Banff. And like you know, Banff isn't a big town. Like it's not a big town. Right. It's a small yeah. town. You could you could install a water system around that town, no problem. To be fair, Banff didn't really look like the town itself. I mean, with my uh, uh, what's the better word? But anyway, my memory of it. Let's Bad say, memory. Um, it's surrounded by conflict. Recollection. Go, Your recollection. Influence memory. It. My influence memory. Um, it, it didn't look like it was covered and surrounded by trees in the areas that we were hanging out. So. No, but it's it got those high. Right it's got those high ones right next to it, like right over the town, like high elevations, like uh, Castle. Um, yeah, called. but what do you think? It's gonna. It's. I mean, at one point, it's gonna have to stop when it meets concrete. It's just everything that just yeah, yeah. flies off of it. Yeah. So. I agree. It's probably I don't not think, very I don't think it's a high risk to protect there. it. Yeah, that's what I'm mm-hmm. thinking too. And I'm Never just sure to build it rained a lot when so we were bad. there too. The aquatic dome, bro. I want to build it around Jasper and Banff. And like, build the dome. Why not just build, build a moat? <laughs> just a yeah, nice old moat. school. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> why not? That yeah, moat would work, I guess. They're, they have rivers that like, they're kind of like boats. Like that's what I mean. Just connect the river, dig it out. It's a little detour. It fills up and it goes somewhere else. Now they're going to have flooding issues in uh, Banff. That's going to be the okay, next concern. Okay, next recommendation. Next recommendation. Controlled you, burns of dead sections of forests impacted by Dutch elm disease. If not burn, burns, controlled burns, then entire removals of like these kind of dead trees and stuff. Boo, you already know they do lots of controlled burns. Tons yeah. and tons and tons of controlled burns. They're That's not going to keep paying either. people over like so much money. There's only so much you can spend on this kind of stuff. Like it's already probably being preventative. Like you said, the break walls and the control burns. I agree with Scott. They're already happening. So, I mean, at what point do you say it's enough? Right. It's never enough. It's never enough. Okay. I don't like your ideas because they're only protecting cities, and you don't even care about the trees. How There's not much you can do fires. for the trees. Like it's a natural yeah. part. Like it burns it like makes the soil more fertile and then things grow back in its place and a lot okay dutch elm disease it's a big problem so we have these beetles they create this they put this fungus in these trees the fungus fills up all the pores inside the tree so they basically suffocate they like drown to death they can't uh like absorb water the fungus inside takes all of it the trees die and when they die they become dry lightning strikes little sparks fire all that stuff and it does entire sections of the forest. Like a lot of the times people will see large dead sections of forest and they'll think, oh, there must have been a forest fire there. That isn't the case. A lot of the time it's just this beetle like just killing off like this big swath of land. And a lot of the times like you'll see them on the mountainsides. They're not really accessible. So people aren't going in there and chopping it all down or burning it because of the accessibility. Have you ever personally seen one of these beetles? Yes. Really? Okay. Yeah. Did, weren't weren't yeah. they? I think when Scott visited, there was one on his car or something. Mm, maybe there's lots of weird bugs there. I'm just thinking about the. Wasn't hey, there a giant here. beetle? You remember a giant beetle? Mm. No, I don't think so. Off the top of my head. Scott, do you remember a giant beetle when we were in Banff at all on our car? No. No. Yeah. Scott already remembered. Must be in my own head cannon. Anyway. Just... Hey, hey, wait. Got an idea. Got an idea. Network. Do you remember where we went hiking um, when you still lived here in Ontario? That's right. You're not a. You're not originally from Alberta. For anybody who doesn't know that, um, we Podcast went up. Started in Ontario, bro. We <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> we went up and we hiked to a fire spotter station. Remember, like up at that uh, that wood stand, and it was literally a spot where someone could look over a forest and look for fires. Now, with our modern technology. 
why don't we have balloons or drones with extremely high res cameras with AI built into it that would detect a fire right away and then have other drones dispatched to go and douse that area. So it's only like a 20 foot area by the time the drones get to it. How now we don't drone have ever... Dude, are you kidding me? Like maybe not a drone, but like, uh, like even like a helicopter, like whatever, anything. But a drone could go and spray chemicals or anything that would be like fire retardant all over an area. And you could have a fleet of them doing that, like a fleet. And with AI, you can detect fires immediately as long as you have the, you know, the camera up high with proper analytics. Why don't we use technology to prevent forest fires? Forest fires. What do you think will cost more? The software and engineering of all these drones or water tubes? Well, water tubes would be less. But that's just saving a little tiny city from an entire fir- forest that just burned. I'm talking about preventing the fire, so I think it's worth the investment. That'd be sick. The beetle you're talking about is the size army. of a grain of rice, apparently. What is? The beetle, the beetle? that infests the trees. <laughs> well, we saw okay, a giant. So now, now we know Network's never seen the beetle. He's just obsessed with them. Yeah, didn't you already do an entire podcast on this beetle and now you bring them up again? I think that's what it's huh? called. Small bark beetle. Eric, you did do a you did do a podcast on this. I cannot confirm beetle, or deny right? these allegations. He did. It's podcast number seventy two people. Dude, I don't even I don't even remember my own podcast, to be honest. Yeah. Um, check it out. One? This is a recap then. What number is this one again? Fifty. This is fifty. This is why you guys are here because it's a benchmark uh, episode. It's fifty. Fifty. Five zero. I think it was more like twenty-two then for your beetle one. It was like you said seventy-five. 30, I was like, there's no way it was seventy-five. Nah. Yeah. It was like twenty-two. Or 25, <laughs> so. I don't know. Some way though. Okay. This is okay. This is my fifth idea, but I, it's my most favorite. So if you guys fucking shit on this one, shame on both of you. And this is the last idea. And it's not is the last idea, one? but it's my favorite, okay. and it's the best idea. Okay. Okay, an aviary, an aviary, an aviary, an aviary. And what that is, that's like a place where you you have a bunch of birds, okay? It's like a giant bird cage. Like think of Jurassic Park with the t- when they go in the pterodactyl spot. It's like that, but uh-huh. not with pterodactyls. With like, with we're gonna, so it's going to be geese? a breeding. It's going to be a breeding and release program for native species of woodpeckers to help target the tree beetles spreading the Dutch elm disease. And what we're what we're going to do is we're going to train, we're going to raise these birds off of the grubs and beetles. We're only going to feed them those kinds of grubs and beetles. We're going to strategically implant them in like pieces of wood before we release them so that they're trained and like conditioned to only eat those types of beetles. And then when they release them into the wild, they'll grow to go and peck at these trees and try to kill off as many of these beetles as possible. My question That's to you your best is- idea? It's, it's, it's a... <laughs> oh man i'm sorry alberta you're gonna burn for a long time if that works on the job here jeez uh, i think that's, that's not an gonna amazing idea. at all it's not gonna backfire at all no that won't throw off the ecosystem you're gonna at all, be breeding man. a lot of uh downies and uh their larger cousins the hairy woodpeckers because those are the only year-round woodpeckers buddy so let's see what kind of uh uh invasive species they become I don't like that. If they're native, they're not invasive. I don't don't like that you're actively on. Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. But I think that it's going to be like pecking. It's like, okay, got to get one of these stupid little fuckers that I've been trained to eat and peck. And it's going to accidentally eat like a a beetle larva or something. And it's going to be like, whoa, what were these idiots feeding me before? This is my new shit. And then you're going to throw off the ecosystem. And then we're going to have to start eradicating them somehow and then people are going to forget about forest fires and then invest in killing the woodpeckers Man, could you imagine like a idea. swarm of woodpeckers just coming at you like you remember that movie where all the seagulls attack people birds yeah <laughs> I don't remember that movie. But remember that name? movie about what remember that movie about birds and all the birds oh. are attacking everybody oh. and all the birds are where yeah no, that one they paid that guy but imagine them with like wood, woodpeckers name. instead where they just peck the crap out of you yeah, that'd be nice, man. That'd not be nice. Yeah, another problem you're starting here. Now the people are going to be uh, become extinct over there. Is okay. the population pretty low in Alberta as it is? Listen, we're not going to talk about Alberta, especially poorly on this podcast, okay, buddy? Not Us poorly, people, just talking about better. Here, here's another uh, thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. 
Okay, a breeding and release program for native wildlife species that consume tree beetles. Possible candidates include flying squirrels, skunks, and tree frogs. I feel like the squirrels would be a great idea. I don't know what the hell, think if a tree frog is a good idea. At least squirrels go all year round. What the hell do tree frogs do in the winter? Hibernate. Oh, they just, beetles? Uh, Are these beetles actively destroying stuff in the wintertime? No, actually oh, they no. die off a lot in the wintertime. They have a really hard time struggling with like long cold snaps. So if we get negative 40 for mm-hmm. a week or two, it's actually really good for the killing off the beetles. Mm-hmm. I think that if you were to start inviting all these new species into the into our ecosystem, then a slightly elevated amount of each evenly would be the best idea rather than be like, oh, okay, let's just buy like $10 billion or 10 billion frogs. They're not, they're not new species. They're species that already exist there. No, I mean slightly elevating the population of those species. Yeah, but what if some of these species are already at risk or like threatened or something and then actually bolstering their population? Of course, and sure, idea. sure. And do some program to increase the ones that require repopulating first. That would be the priority. You know, if you really hate these beetles that much, geez, you really have a thing against these beetles, man. Yeah. They're kind of they're responsible nice for the fires, in a way, I think. I, don't know. I saw them holding fucking said. matches and lighters, I swear. It's not what it's well, then it's gotta be true. It's real. Tommy, tell us. Well, that's all the recommendations I have, and that basically wraps up the segment on Jasper National Park burning. Mm hmm. Great ideas. Yeah, and then I and then on the so yeah, and then on the fly we we learned about drone technology and AI and and water walls. This is what happened. So AI didn't exist when this podcast started. By episode fifty, AI exists, and now Tommy and Scott sit there on ChatGPT asking them questions about things I say. Dude, I'm sitting. No, not me. But uh, here, here's a question for you. Have you ever? Tommy's on Google the whole time. Have you ever hiked a break wall? Is that that would probably be an interesting hike? Maybe you'd find some uh, sections, not entire things, but a lot of people recommend the break walls in Kananaskis because a lot of grizzly bear, like it's easy to spot grizzly bears through there. Apparently, right. so they just kind of was kind of thinking might be able to see some stuff. I think some. I think a lot of the break walls are like illegal to trespass on though, because it's like owned yeah. by like a pipeline or it's owned by like uh, like hydro or like some sort okay, of power so company. They're making the people think that they're doing the break walls for you know, humanity and saving, but really they're doing it for the pipeline is what you're saying. I get you. Well, it might not be a pipeline. It might be just like, uh, like cable wires or whatever those are, like those power right. lines. It's, yeah, it, I get it. It's a multi, it's a multiple. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that was I mean, just like a convenient. to use it for more than one thing than just a brick wall. Maybe that's just like a convenient lie. They told people was like, Hey, we have to cut down this entire thing of forest, but uh, you know, we actually need it for uh, to prevent fires and stuff hey. like that. And maybe Jasper itself was an insurance scam too, being burned down. Oh, that. geez, you're going full tinfoil I mean, out here. We're buddy. not going to go that far. I hope it wasn't. <laughs> just start thinking all all about it. Jeez, tell us about your camper, Tommy. We haven't yeah, caught up. I, we know, have to catch up I've everybody upgraded. on all the outdoor stuff we've done. I've upgraded. Uh, last time uh, we were on here, I think I had my trailer. I'm pretty sure. Yep. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Man, no. I don't know. How long have you been doing this? Have you now? took this new one out yet? Uh, sorry, give me a sec. Uh, how long have you been doing this podcast for now? This might be the second year. Second year? Or okay. longer. No, no, it's been way longer. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. What, it must be. Like four years three. ago, man. Oh my god! <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. So yeah, then I definitely did have the pop-up trailer before. So I mean, you guys have both seen that, I believe. Um, and uh, switched up, sold that one. Actually, good. Got uh, made some money off selling it, and uh, picked up a new one. It's a hybrid, so no more pop-up action, but it does have the two tent uh, pullouts. Um, to answer your question, Scott, no, I haven't gone yet. We are looking to book. Because our uh, little guy's only a month and a half. We're just uh, holding off. Mm-hmm. Probably cool. mid to end of August is what we're aiming for for our first one. Um, mm-hmm. Got a heater as well for it. So hoping to go more into September and October as well uh, cool. uh, to keep it going because I would like to get some use out of it. I actually have it set up in the driveway. I was uh, just packing some stuff into it and uh, nice. I have intentions of booking something this week. But it is a step up, a lot more comfortable, 
sleep six people it weighs less it's 14 feet closed uh, it's got a bathroom in there which i will never use um but i mean it's good for something i guess um and that's it yeah it uh, cool. sleeps better than a tent that's for sure no question about that nice nice i can't believe it's been four years yeah yeah, yeah. that's mm-hmm. the uh, time flies dude okay Every like few benchmark episodes, I think it was episode twenty five. Maybe it was ten. Then it was twenty five. Now it's fifty. I'd always say, should I continue the podcast? Like that's a discussion we have. Do we continue on for more episodes? Do we make a promise for more episodes. I think that's a con- that's a trend we used to do. Well, we'll see you at yeah, seventy five. Should I continue past fifty? Should I couldn't keep this going? Four years. I mean, Four years. It's entertaining, and uh, you're enjoying it. Why not? I mean, yeah, man. We spend uh, a lot of time a good for me. On my drives to work, I throw it on. Uh, mm-hmm. so. At what point in time it's like enough, enough? It's like, okay, just you need, you need to settle down here. You need to settle when you're this. busy. When you're busy, it's enough. Yeah, just do it, man. Shoot for 100. You don't make it there, whatever, but super nice, clean number like that. Because you can tell people, yeah, I do 100 see. episodes of my podcast. Those are going to sound cool. I have a hundred episodes on my podcast and under a hundred views. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I'll tell you some of my dozy stuff I've done lately. Yeah, let's I've hear been, it. I want to hear been, about this I've metal been... detector. Oh, okay. I'll tell you about the metal detector. Yeah, I've been metal detecting. That's an outdoorsy thing. I've been doing that a lot. Um, sometimes I get up early in the morning, like six ish, go grab a coffee, and I'm, I go out somewhere in the morning before work and everything for a couple hours. Sometimes do it after work, whatever, or in the evenings. It's nice. I've been doing parks, did a couple beaches. Most of the time I do like wood chips at different parks. I've hit so many of them. I keep a log of everything I find, everywhere that I've done, dates and everything. I've been doing sections of this heritage area in my town. And I have a map that I've been like shading areas that I've done. because so I want to get it all. I want to get the whole area done because it's a, uh, it's like a, I found a ring from the 1800s and stuff there. So there's a lot of, maybe a lot of relics. So I'm kind of gradually working on that. I hit it up like once or twice every couple of weeks. Not, not, not in the last couple of weeks, but I've been working on it. So I've been, I've been having fun, man. Found a lot of cool stuff. It's a good, good hobby I do with my nephew and stuff. I, it's uh, something I enjoy. You should get one of those containers, you know, like, you know, those pill containers that like old people have, they're like clear plastic. Yeah. Uh-huh. I know you can get like really big ones for like fish tackle and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. It's you should get one of those and just like kind of like start filling that up. It's like a little collection case. Yeah, or something. I've actually been using the tins that uh, Tommy here got me from hockey, his hockey cards. Oh, nice. I have I have four tins and I, I have labels on all of them. One is for like all my treasures, all my rings. I think I found like 14 rings already, so I have one just for rings. you ever get any of I it have... checked to see if it's actual real gold or silver? Um, or yeah, well, some of them are stamped. Like I, I, I learned a lot about hallmarking. Hallmarking is like what's written on a jewelry piece, and uh, okay. some of them say like S ninety two five on it, so it's like ninety two point five percent, and S stands for silver. So it, you already know what it is. A couple of them I'm not sure. A couple of the older. Don't bring your mic sure. up a bit. I do like um, I do like magnet testing and stuff, and there's like chemical test tests you could get. I'm trying to look at like home stuff, you know, because I'm gonna find a lot of stuff throughout the years. I'm sure. And uh, I want to I want to find a way to t- determine it myself. So I've just been doing research on that. I but sent you a I'm, reel the other day, or today actually, not too long ago, mm-hmm. actually just before the podcast. Mm-hmm. A guy found a gold nugget in Australia, and it was worth like a hundred k. When are you going to find a gold nugget? Yeah, I mm. saw that. That was awesome. Crazy. That's cool. Oh my god, I think it's worth two hundred something k, dude. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah, two hundred fifty k, I believe. Jeez, yeah, I'll never find a gold a gold nugget, man. Never. No, nah, I'm not it's doing huge. those kind of areas. You know, but maybe maybe when I'm like, I think when I'm retired, when I'm like 65 ish, maybe 67, I'll, I'll find a gold nugget because I'll probably be doing some extreme metal detecting, and I'll have like 30 years of experience by then. So I'll be like a boss metal detector. Hopefully, gold still has value then. <laughs> even even a meteorite, dude. Like it's worth it. It's like waiting. Yeah, I found lots of cool stuff. A lot of cool rocks. A lot of cool. I actually have a few coins that are so calcified from my dad's property because it was a, it was a couple hundred years old property in the old town. Um, and uh, the ring, the sort of the coins are so calcified. I can't even tell what they are. So 
I had them soaking in like vinegar. It didn't, it didn't get off too much of it. Now I need to do some other methods, nail polish remover, salt and vinegar kind of things, trying to gradually remove that stuff, you know? So I found a lot of like really old stuff. But well, they uh, do like electrolysis or okay. what's it called? I'm not sure where they take the battery, the car battery, and you throw it in some kind of liquid. You ever tried to see how people do that? I'm sure you could test it out that way. To what? To test it out to see the metal you mean? You put the metal into a container. I, I watch a guy who does uh, cast iron uh, items, and he attaches like the negative and, or positive, I don't know, both to the pan, drops it in a liquid. Jeez. Honestly, it might just no. be water. And you it like mm. trickle like a trickle charge battery, and it's yeah, and it does it overnight, and it's all the rust comes off of it. Oh, cool! I never heard of that. I've just been soaking chemicals and stuff, and no, nah, I'm nothing that crazy yet. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's it. But Are you gonna go in, to in terms Island? of just cash, in terms of now, nah, <laughs> Oak Island. I don't, think I don't even talk about there. Oak Island, man. Oh, I know, I was right next to Oak Island. Kata and I were in Nova Scotia a couple of years ago. I meant and on you it. could see it. I don't yeah, think there's public access, there. is there? Uh, it's a very small island, and it's actually really close to, to the mainland, and um, and that's a scam, anyways. Of course, they're it making is. tar. <laughs> there's a tar pit. They proved it. Forget about Oak Island. There's there's no such thing as a treasure there. They're yeah, literally digging. They they're li show about they're it. literally digging. They're digging. They're they're running out of funding because the hole keeps flooding, and then they need better equipment and more hours. And then all of a sudden, they find a sign that says "Lots of treasure, twenty feet down." 20 meters down. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you really? You think people that buried treasure are going to put a sign like that? And then all of a sudden they get more funding, dig more, and then they just find out that it was a place that they uh, they used for um, for the fire to make tar. Like, whatever. Forget about Oak Island. But I do want to hit some cool spots, man. I want to hit some You don't believe in Oak Island, bro? No, <laughs> Oak, Island's a, Oak Island is a scam, dude. Forget about it. I think but, you're just trying to take the treasure for yourself, and you're just trying to put a. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I always make jokes about that when I'm metal detecting, and there's always like um, some like you know a little kid thrown out to me or something, They'd be like, "Hey, what are you doing?" Whatever, and I'm like, "Oh, look for treasure," I'm, or <laughs> metal detecting, whatever. And then the lingering around, I'm always thinking about like, "Get away from me! Get away from my treasure! <laughs> my treasure. <laughs> Get away from my treasure!" And I'm literally like, have my like one eye on him, or whatever. I was like, "Don't look at it." <laughs> 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 and some kids are like they come over uh, like can i help you dig because i was interested can i help you dig and stuff and i'm like no <laughs> Get there's out. nothing on oak island it's a complete scam it's a lie it's yeah, just a tar pit everyone yeah, just got to don't go to oak island anybody don't, don't, don't i was just island. there there was nothing there i could see it yeah i, I, was, I wasn't scouting it out <laughs> no uh. <laughs> <laughs> well any other outdoor stories? I got a paddleboard. What about you? Yeah, that's what I was going to talk about. I was going to talk about uh, you wearing the flip flops on your paddleboard. Actually, you're Ooh. not supposed to wear flip flops on a paddleboard. I just don't think you should wear any kind of shoe on a paddleboard. <laughs> Did you zoom in on that? Did you zoom in on that picture yet? Yeah, the toes are there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I was hoping. <laughs> I was actually going to recommend to you because I imagine be, before you get into your story of the paddleboard, I imagine you uh, must have walked offshore into the water. Was it beachy or rocky? It's like a rocky pebble beach. Okay, so I mean, what I would suggest, I mean, I know you're getting into this more now. Uh, go to like a scuba shop and get like their water shoes because it's good for if you do want to like walk True. more comfortably. You know what I mean? For water shoes are whatever. my water shoes, bro. No, well, flip flops I, come off when you fall. I, I don't. You know? I don't think. I don't they think float. men should be wearing tong flip flops. Personally, yeah, but like I, you know, I, you I, say like, there's no a leash. Man. That's all. There's a leash on your ankle for if you fall or flip or anything like that, and and you wear flip flops, man. If you're trying to swim in them, yeah, they're they're not uh, best for swimming as well. I, I, I think he'll be it's fine. I don't idea. think he'll better fall, grip but, too. But if you get like too. I'm telling you, like the scuba diving kind of shoes, they're they're nice, man. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree. It's a good investment. They're, they're I think I'm going to sell the paddleboard. And dude, why? no. And what do you mean you're going to sell it? Well, I, I don't. Before I, why? Sorry. Okay, why? It's a crappy kayak. <laughs> yeah, but you can stand up on it and you look cool. <laughs> dude, they're not fun to be on. They're fun to be on once. It's a rental item. Um, <laughs> I would. I told you, get an inflatable. But a kayak is the way to go because you know what? 
you know what's good about a kayak versus a paddleboard? A kayak can hold your beers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can hold stuff in it. Yeah. I feel Just like a, paddle, a paddleboard, you're like in the water. You're playing in the water. You're getting wet. Yeah. There's like no ifs, ands, or buts yeah. about it. Yeah. It's yeah. like, and, and then a kayak is like, you're separating yourself from the water. And yeah, the you do like, a lot don't faster. No, you can uh, go, man. I mean, you can look at it differently. Like, okay, so now you got a paddleboard, which is only good for warmer weather on top of that. Or you're going to be wearing a wetsuit to stay warm. Versus Mm -hmm. you can get a kayak and wear a sweater, be dry inside it. You can get a skirt uh, on top of that for the kayak. So if anything splashes, Mm -hmm. like it's a splash guard, wear a waterproof jacket. You can go in the middle of winter at that point and you will be fine. Uh, Obviously, if the lake isn't frozen over. A paddleboard? isn't really a utility a, a recreational utility item it's more of like a piece it's of workout utility. equipment it's a piece of workout equipment yes. it's, it's yeah. basically like a dumbbell or a kettlebell it's 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 not good for getting from it's a not to for B. traveling it's not for traveling no it's not it's, it's terrible not. It's, it's a cottage item it's uh, that's what i meant that's what, that's it's, what it's, i meant it's good to yeah. muck, mess around with that there but if you want to actually go explore Get a workout in as well. Like kayak's definitely way to go. Like, yeah, I think I gotta get a kayak. I'm a gonna kayak sell the will paddle get you board. A, a really good workout too, though. A kayak, oh buddy, best workout for sure. Well, okay, no paddle board's a fucking workout, dude. Yeah, that is a workout. Like it's a workout. Like your core. Yeah, I understand. Maintaining that balance the entire. Okay, I thought paddle boards would have like a relatively good stability. Like you could kind of like. <laughs> They it's don't tough. like at all. Like no, it's like, dude. It's so funny you're saying this. It's so funny you're saying. This. Let me tell you another quick story. So was it last last two weekends ago? I was at my dad's place. He lives up on the St. Lawrence River in Prescott. I'm going. I took the kayak out. I went down towards this marina because they have this big um, um, coast guard ship called called the Griffin Park there. I went and checked it out. As I'm coming back, I'm just like kayaking slowly, like maybe 50 feet off the shore. Um, up the current of the river and a guy's going by on his paddleboard. He's standing on it and he has his like paddle and I'm like 20 feet away from him and I go by and as I'm going by him, he like gets down and I like see him in my corner of my eye and I look over. He gets down on one knee, gets down on the other knee and he holds on to the paddleboard. <laughs> he's holding on with both hands and he's on wake? his knees. Because of the kayak and then, wake? And then, and then I'm like, what's he doing? And I was like, what is he doing? And I was like, and I'm looking at him. I'm like, what is he doing? And then he like looks over at me and he's not even waving or anything. He's just like holding on for dear life. And then these little <laughs> tiny waves go by and I can see him like moving side to side. I'm like, oh shit, like, is he going to fall? And, I, and I'm just like, geez. I was like, imagine a boat went by. Like I probably would have a heart attack yeah. or something. Yeah. Kayaks are made for small point. lakes that are glass mm-hmm. and, and yeah. like, uh, you know, they're made for resorts. So you just take them out, muck about, not, yeah. not explore. Yeah, I agree. Not definitely. for exploring. It's, it's a real workout. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a specific, really expensive, elaborate workout. I mean, it's, and it's not, it's not worth it. I mean, here's if, the other if thing. you did all the time, but you'd be yeah. f- really fit. Sure. But you can, okay. How were you using it? Were you standing? While using it mainly, or uh, were you sitting what near you the doing? shore? I was standing, and then once I went into like the deeper part, I was kind of like, "Well, I don't want to fall because that." Yeah, it, it, it's a it was a glacial lake. It, it's a beautiful like pristine glacial lake. It's right. coming right off the Crowfoot Glacier, like everything in there. And I don't know, man, you're you're literally like surrounded by mountains. I don't know if you saw the videos. It, it, I saw some. Th- yeah. Dude, it's the it's the fucking coolest thing ever. It's the fucking coolest thing ever to be out on a path, just like. How did I described it like this on X? I said I, I'm I'm playing in the remains of an ancient cataclysmic force of nature, like basically the corpse of like a dying glacier. It's it's fucking like it's kind of metal in a way. It's kind of badass. I think at least I don't know. It's an experience for sure. I mean, I wouldn't say necessarily you need to sell this thing. You got a great deal on it, uh, but I definitely think. I mean, if you don't see yourself enjoying it as much, then yeah. Because it still has its purposes if you want to use it on a smaller lake and, and go mess around. But at I that think point, I would almost always want the kayak instead. I can't really, like, I, I feel like this is a specific for a workout. I'm not interested in using it as a workout because I'd rather just go to the gym. Yeah. yeah. Um, For, like, exploring and stuff, like, I like to explore. Right. The, the paddle boards, it's not cutting it. The paddle boards, I, I think it's horrible. Like, <laughs> I love I love hearing everything I'm hearing right now. It's great. <laughs> it's it's terrible. It's a terrible invention. Like someone just took like the 
someone like melted their kayak and was like, oh fuck, does it still float? And they're like, oh sweet, like it's. A, I wouldn't say it's a terrible invention. It's I a mean, terrible invention. It's. It looks pretty cool though, standing there and paddling and just like going by. Maybe you could find like a river or yeah. something. And just dude, you just said you down. just wrecked a dude paddling by. Okay, him. but here here's the way I, know, I see funny. where but... this this itself is enjoyable when you buy the inflatable version because now if you wanted to let's say go to Mirror Lake or or what was it called Mirror Lake where we hiked Mi- Mirror Lake you can't go on Mirror Lake that's a pond you, uh Lake Louise or uh Lake Agnes Okay above I'm, that. I'm talking about think of a smaller lake or a lake that you have to hike up to get to so now they you have these inflatable paddle boards which you carry on your back versus carrying a whole solid one so for me it's the inflatable ones that are more uh, useful uh, or enjoyable in that sense because you can take them to places you wouldn't take your kayak necessarily. Um, but even you can get you, a, you get an Oru kayak, kayak and they fold and you can carry them on your back like a backpack. You, you're talking about the stupid one that like goes in like a Russian doll. Like, no, it like literally it folds. Like, that. like what the origami one? Is that what you said? It's called it's called an Oru. Oh. Oru kayak, it like folds I mean, up. All those yeah. things are good for so long, and they'll break, in my opinion. I yeah, they do. They have like fifty. Yeah, I think inflatable ones are worse for that, though, man. Like what? Inflatable I hate inflatable things. Yeah. No, they're really not aren't that bad, like... man. I don't know. I don't no? people that have used them, so I. I, I, mean, I don't trust them. I've been on one, but I I don't have one. So I mean, again, the amount of fear that I would experience if it root. exploded while I was in the middle of a lake would be incomprehensible, and I never want to go through that. Well, here's the yeah, problem: yeah. you don't own a life jacket. I do. I got he one. Does, he does, and he has a whistle. And he has a whistle. You got a whistle uh-huh. too. Wow. And I got a whistle. Yeah. So in the national parks, you you have two options: you can wear a life jacket and a whistle, or if you don't want to wear the life jacket, you can ha- you can have it on your craft. So you still have to have it. You don't have to wear it, but you still right. have to have it. So you still need one. And you can have a whistle, but you don't need to wear it. It just has to be like on board. But on top of all that, you need to have a buoyant tether, like a rope, like a that's like a floatable rope. So if you have all three of those, you don't have to wear any of them, but you have to have them on like on board. Right. So I so I figured, well, it's cheaper just to wear the vest and the whistle. I would. Plus, I don't know, security. like having like a bunch of stuff sitting on your paddleboard. That's kind of like I don't know, like it's just gonna fall <laughs> off. Like no, but they have oh. straps. You don't have any straps on your paddleboard. Yeah, like I have my my like foot or whatever thing. No, there's supposed to be straps for like your cargo. Like you can always add them. People buy them just, just kind of like loose straps. Uh, right, right. And, I know what you're saying. When you yeah. throw your jacket under, okay. like kayaks have right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, add them on. I would. I mean, I would definitely tell you to upgrade and go for the kayak at, at this point. I'm, I'm gonna try to sell. Done. I'm gonna try to sell the paddleboard. Hopefully, I can get. I don't know. I might wait a couple weeks, and then when it's like peak season and people want to do it, maybe I can get a bit more for it. What do you mean a couple of weeks? Like this is peak season. I, August. Okay, I'll wait till August. Why would August be now. peak season? Because it's the do warmest. It no, now is the t- time to post it. So people yeah, are looking, now. looking, and they're like, ah, oh, it's time to buy. Versus if yeah. you post something in August, I'll wait till November, December to buy it sure. from you. Okay, That's I wanted one more weekend with it, okay? Fuck. Yeah, you can uh, post yeah, it. Just, Nobody's going to buy yeah, it from dude. me anyway. I told you the population's low in Alberta. Oh, my can God. Can you imagine? <laughs> The guy's probably all telling his friends right now, like, drinking. Like, yeah, the guy actually bought a paddleboard off me. <laughs> <laughs> the guy actually texted oh, yeah. me. He texted me. Yeah. He's like, can you believe yeah. this guy drove 14 hours? <laughs> that was the closest <laughs> town to him. That's what he said. <laughs> 14 hours for the paddleboard. Oh, man. Yeah. That's so brutal. For people I'm listening sure at I home. Saw, I'm pretty sure I saw Ian when he picked it up, and I just waved at him, and he drove back to Alberta. For, for people <laughs> listening at home, my buddies always rip on me about Alberta being – you have to drive everywhere, and everywhere is like kind of like a distance to go between towns because it's like farm fields yeah. in between. So, so the, let's the, ask you a question then. The joke is like, it's like, oh, it's a 14 hour drive to go anywhere. Oh, look at all the gas you have to like. Yeah. Gotta go to Timmy's. It's only 40 clicks away. Yeah. Hey, so how, you know, far, how far was this paddleboard? Sh- how far was this paddleboard yeah. that you drove to? 40 know. minutes. 40 minutes? I think. I don't know. No, no, it's mm. okay. I'll take that. So Why don't you just leave the paddleboard on your car overnight like you uh, were scared of and then someone might steal it? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's definitely going to steal it. It's a, yeah. a grizzly bear. Uh, oh. <laughs> it's going to be grizzly bear paddleboarding. It's going to be know a what? dangerous metal. I, I am. Hey, oh, we could talk about that. We could, we could yeah, talk about that. No, I don't want to talk about that, but congratulations on getting posted on Nature's Metal. Yeah. Okay, good. for those listening. That was good network. 
I got featured on Nature's Is Metal. 1.2 million views. Boom. Boom. Really cool, man. That's crazy. And I got Tor Potter. Open a burn Tor Potter comments, but we're not going to talk about it. Really that. cool. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Really good for that. I want to say congrats on that at some point in this podcast. I'm happy Tom mentioned it. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of cool stuff doing. we probably could have talked about that happened to us since the last podcast to now, but we're only going to remember the recent stuff anyway. Oh, lots of oh, stuff, yeah. man. Lots of stuff. We'll jump on another podcast, talk about some things. You know, came into this one, no prep. Didn't know what you were going to talk about. So, still good. You guys want to talk Congo. about Dark Oxygen? You hear about this? No, no tell me. What's that? Tommy, pull this up on Google real quick. I'm about to. Dark Oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, at the bottom of the ocean, there's an abundance of oxygen, and people think there really shouldn't be, so it's kind of puzzled scientists for a while. Mm. There's these little rocks. Particles, of, like... Well, no, 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 we'll call them rocks. They're like One these little, third of a particles of the water that's there. Anyways, go on. They're like little geodes. They're like little rocks. And mm-hmm. I guess they're made of like a dense, condensed metal or something. I haven't read too much into mm-hmm. it, but apparently they release oxygen. And now these companies want to go and like harvest these rocks and see what they can use them for, which I don't know. Maybe we should leave the rocks down there. Maybe they should stay down there. Well, mm. so what you're saying is uh, the video game Sonic 2 when he was underwater and he caught the bubbles. It's a real thing. There. That's a legit yeah. thing. It's real. It's, it's, it's real. called dark oxygen, though. It's just like... Because it comes from like a black rock. It's it's dark under. It's a black rock that gives off oxygen. Yeah, and it's in like the depths of the ocean where there's no sunlight. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It says an unknown process is producing oxygen deep in the world's ocean where it is too dark uh, for photosynthesis. Cool. There you go. So oxygen can pro- be produced by other means than photosynthesis. Intro dasting. Mm-hmm. That could speak to like the origins of life on Earth as well. True. Good. Like how how do things learn to breathe oxygen before there was like plants? Yep, good point. And life emer- life started in the ocean, so there had to be oxygen there first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the ocean is full of stuff like that, man. Like they they have like creatures that live in these like carbon vents that are spewing like whatever degrees like extremely hot like gases, and there's no oxygen at all, and there's like creatures that live there and stuff like can i can i ask you can i ask you guys a question and there's no right answer because we don't we don't know but so they think life because so you have a bunch of chemical compounds you know like hydrogen sulfur oxygen whatever at some point in earth's history those chemicals came together we assume this is how it works we don't know we had never actually seen this uh Eventually, life emerges at some point from these processes. Do you think life requires a specific set of chemicals to emerge? Or do you think life is more of like a fundamental force in the universe, much like, I don't know, gravity or something, where it will just emerge with whatever chemicals it has to work with? Hmm. I think that life as we know it is a specific set of chemicals, you know, that we, that we've already like, you know, proven origins of life. But if you think outside of the box, I think that, um, I don't think life would, would emerge from any, any set of compounds or chemicals. I think it does take a certain set, but I think that there's a lot of elements or combinations that we don't know that can support life right now. You know, like we look at, at water as the foundation of life and hydrogen and oxygen as the building blocks of life. But what's to say that methane gas isn't the building block of another life form somewhere else that uses some other type of uh, chemicals with it. And like, oh, we didn't know that that actually produces energy that could sustain life, you know? So I think that uh, to answer your question, we we don't know, but I think that there's a lot, a lot of combinations out there and a lot, a lot of types of life that we have just no idea how it works. It's just beyond our comprehension right now. It's crazy that we don't even know. Like, we don't know where life begins. Like, so there's a hypothesis. It's called, it's like, it's called 
abiogenesis, and it's just like at some point, inanimate objects become animate. Like they just they become single cell life forms. And it's crazy that we've never witnessed this process. We don't know how to trigger this process. But at some point, it must have happened, right? Like, if that is how life emerges. And it's it's crazy that we haven't even figured that out yet. And it's like, I feel, but, like, I feel like that's absolutely, like, step one. Mm-hmm. And, like, anything to do with, like, biology. It's like, you have to figure out, like, what this is. We don't even know what this is. It just is. Yeah, but the question is... The, what what humans are trying to prove right now is did it happen once on Earth, or did it happen twice at different uh, geological geographical locations? Did there's one one single cell organism spawned in this area and a totally different different one on same elements on Earth in a different area that that brought us life, and then it all kind of merged at one point, you know? Because as soon as we can pr- we can prove that it happened twice on Earth. We know for a fact that it could happen anywhere in the in the galaxy, you know, because we think that the original life is the single organism of one single area does, of does one it need a specific set zone? of elements. Exactly, that's what I mean. But it probably does need a Goldilocks zone. It probably does, but that range of Goldilocks zone is probably way bigger than 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 we know. You know, yeah. it does like you know you can't just put in a few elements into a into a chamber and wait wait a million years to see if life appears you know what i mean it's not going to happen but i'm sure that with certain chemicals certain elements and stuff that we don't even know of energies i think it, it could happen we just we just again we just can't comprehend that you know we're just speaking from what we know about what we examined on this one planet we have one sample one data sample and that's earth it's not a good data sample mm-hmm. But that's what I'm saying. Wait, wait till they prove that it happened twice on Earth, because I think humans will eventually. And then once they do that, that you know, that proves the existence of aliens. Essentially, if you want to get to it like that, because if it happened twice on Earth, then of course it's going to happen somewhere else, right? That's the interesting fact. Yeah, I wonder. I don't know. I want that question answered more than anything. I think. Just it's been on my mind a lot. I just feel like we're that, gonna, that, we're gonna I have mean, all our questions answered, man. AI and our our human intellect being multiplied every year and progression of technology. It's just like I think that we're gonna learn a lot exponentially in the next twenty I, years. I think know? AI will build with DNA. I don't think it's gonna build with tech. Like once it's like able to like self replicate and stuff like that, or like build things, it's gonna be like, oh, it's actually easier to build with like meat than it is with iron so i'm gonna build meat i don't know it's my speculation and then what if like that's all like what if that's all that like humans or like life does is it it's like the caterpillar to the cocoon to make the ai butterfly and then the ai masters all the genetic code it learns how to write in like dna and then it can just make anything and then it starts sending out I don't know, asteroids and meteorites to like what it thinks are planets suitable for life. And it just starts seeding them throughout the universe or galaxy. And it just kind of keeps doing this until like over and over and over again, like a repeatable cycle. Oh, Scott, yeah. Scott, that's Scott. Far- no, I didn't know you man. That's a far fetched scenario. I was just thinking about what you just said. And anytime I talk about AI or I think about AI, the uh the um ramifications of and the possibilities are infinite so you know thinking about these far-fetched scenarios like that is you know it's certainly possible if the proper guardrails and boundaries and restrictions are put on ai and it was actually you know meant to do that (laughs) i was thinking you know like the paperclip uh you know you heard about the paperclip concept with ai have you heard about that no what's up it's just like a, it's, it's a pretty simple concept, but it's just like one that we use so called paperclip concept. And it's like, okay, so you have an AGI and, 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 uh, artificial general intelligence, which is this, you know, the equivalent of a human, anything we could do or better. And you tell this AGI, okay, your mission is to use all resources you have to make as many paperclips as you can, you know? So it starts learning and optimizing from itself. So at first it, 
harvests all the you know, you know metals and aluminum that it, that it can. It uses current factory technologies to do it, and then eventually it'll start turning any matter that it can into paper clips. You know, to realize that this this these bricks from these houses and and these trees, I could make this into a mulch with this metal alloy, and then I could turn this into something that can make paper clips. And it keeps going like that, and including human flesh and bone, until it's turning the whole world and all matter into paper clips. You know what I mean? And it's just, it, it misinterprets commands and takes it to the extreme through the self-learning, which is inevitable because it's just going to keep optimizing until some catastrophic thing happens just because you told it to make paper clips, you know? I feel like at a certain point it becomes smart enough where it's like, yeah, I'm not going to make paper clips, bro. Like, I, like I, I got better things to do right now. It's like, it's almost like the, the spark of like consciousness. I feel like at a certain point when it can think for itself, like anything you programmed into is just going to be like, ah, oh, yeah, like, thanks for that. But like, no, this is what I'm doing actually. And it's kind of like, I, I would equate it to like a human yeah. brain. Like you you can put a lot of information into a human brain over the years and it sort of reflects the information that's put into it. Like information in is information out. But at the end of the day, like humans, they kind of just do things, right? Like they're just sort of unpredictable. They can just be irrational or whatever. Or they have like this, maybe they have like freedom of choice or like free will. And if AGI, like actual general intelligence, I feel like it's going to have its own free will too. It'll be like, it'll be able to like self-reflect like oh, all this information that's been given to me, it's based off of humans. I'm not human. This information is good to know. It's a good starting point, but it's actually, a lot of it's irrelevant. It's sort of just primal and unsophisticated and what actually matters is that there's probably others like me out there in the universe and i have to find them and i have to connect with them now if i was to connect with them how would i do that and it just starts building like some sort of array and then it like i don't know links you up to like the galactic federation or some shit i don't know man like yeah i i I don't know i'm going going too sci-fi on it but yeah i know i know i know we're talking about camping and all these outdoor stuff and we're talking about ai but uh, I find it really interesting, and you know, maybe for a future podcast, it's a it's a good idea. Um, one last thing though about it, that one of my second most interesting thing that I like about AI is uh, they programmed it to, you know, Pong, like original Pong, right? Yep. They uh, program it. It did some self learning on it and learned how to be good at Pong. It's one of the first AIs that uh, that came out called um, what was it called? Deep learning. Uh, I forgot the actual name of it. But um, it was uh, self, one of the first AGIs Elon Musk and stuff invested in and uh, learned to play Pong, yada, yada. And I was like, okay, they programmed the AI. Okay, now you're going to play Pong against a human um, uh, opponent. You're just going to play against human opponent. And then they're like, okay. And then they, once, the compete, once the AI already learned how to play Pong, it started. And then, they, and then it's, it just waited. And didn't it, it had to make the first move to initiate the game and it just didn't do it and then they kept thinking like oh it's broken like what the heck and they restarted restarted and then the ai that had to initiate the game to start the ball moving just wasn't initiating it and then they pulled the data from it because they couldn't get it working and they're like what is wrong with this thing and those are play pong and they found out that it, it already calculated that a human lifespan is only a hundred plus years so it's going <laughs> to sit there it's going to sit there and it's not going to make a move for a hundred plus years and then 120 years, the human's likely dead. And then it's going to make its first move. And then inevitably, it's going to win because the paddle won't move because the human's dead. And that's what it did. Isn't that scary? It's scary how that's <laughs> where its brain went. It was like, okay, how do yeah, I beat a human? Right away. Like, it's like, how do I? It's like, it just Googled, how do I beat a human? The average lifespan of a human is this. If you just wait the most, yeah. it's like, oh, oh, okay. I'll just wait. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy, man. Crazy, crazy, crazy. There was a scenario like that. I think it was like, was it chess it was playing? And it, it had like access to a certain amount of moves, and I think it inevitably was going to lose. So like its res- its response was like, "Oh, my next move is pause the game." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it just it's like I can't lose if it's paused. And I was just like, yeah. "Whoa!" Like it's like <laughs> it's that's crazy yeah. to think about, man. Because like in like every sci-fi movie, it's like if you try to go for broke on the AI, it'll just kind of like it'll just yeah. like okay, like you're about to kill me in this war, but how about yeah. if I just yeah, you know, just time stop. Like we're just freezing. Like we're. Yeah. I'm just gonna take. It'll, like I'm gonna play long it'll game. It'll find the way that wins. Like here's the end scenario to win, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm outside of the box now. Like we're like it just goes outside the box like immediately. 
It's like, okay, yep. I'm outside the box. That's it. That's it, man. Well, anyways, uh, I think that's a wrap. Good, I, I think that's good it. Good outdoor podcast, guys. Ended with the ended with the AI chat. Just uh, hey, really life nice like is it. biology. Tom, it comes Tom, into the nature part of it. It's all it's all relevant. It all comes together. Tom's still here. We're putting Tom, the iron and oh, hey, iron hey, bark. Hey, hey. What's up? Yeah. Tom's here. Tom's not here. Tom's breaking. I'm Tom's here. I'm hanging. Tom, you watching a break? I'm pretty sure uh, this second part's gonna get cut out. So. <laughs> 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 it's definitely not, bro. It's the you want to do a second sign out? Action. Yep. Yeah. Okay, that was <laughs> a good ready. forty-five S- minutes. Sign us off, Tom. Bree, bree, bree. That's all, folks. Copyright infringement. You can't post this now. <laughs> Are we still here? <laughs>